Hello everyone. If anyone can't hear, please could you just type us a message, but hopefully everybody's okay, can hear what I'm saying. So welcome. I'm Sue Rabbit from the Environment and Buildings team, and I'll be chairing our webinar on changes to the environmental permitting rules for pig farming. And I'm here with Emmett Slater and Nigel Pennington. And I'm also pleased to welcome Tom Judd and Alison Frogley from the Environment Agency. We've been running a series of workshops with the Environment Agency around the country over the last few weeks. And if you didn't make one of those meetings, this is your chance to catch up. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be made available on our website shortly if you've got any colleagues or anyone else you think might uh, make use of it. Now, uh, the way things we're hoping are going to work is our presentation will last for about 45 minutes in total. Um, and questions can be sent in at any time by writing. Just type in the box on the left of your screen. And then at the end, Nigel will read them out uh, one at a time, and one of the team will answer them. And we're aiming to finish by about 6.30, unless we've got millions of questions, of course. And uh, please, could I just also ask you to keep yourselves muted? So that's it then. I think, um, I think we're ready to go. So the aim of the session today The aim of the session today, can I just get onto the next slide? I'm just trying to get onto the next slide. Thank you. So the aim of the, next, the session today then is to just explain the review process and the changes uh, to permitting rules. Um, and as you can see on the screen there, it's just to understand the changes. I think the most important thing is perhaps to be able to ask questions. So essentially we'll be focusing on the key changes um, much is remaining the same. So this wonderful document called the best, uh, the best available techniques document, reference document, um, was published on the 21st of February this year, which sets the standards that permitted farms will need to meet. And we've got four years to implement those changes. Um, so that's the, be the really the basis of why things have changed. So I'm now going to hand over to Alison from the Environment Agency to um, explain a bit more about that. Thank you, Alison. Thank you, Sue. Okay, if you can move on to the next slide. Can we have the next? Thank you. Sorry, a little delay there. Okay, thanks, Sue. Good evening, everyone. I'm Alison Frogley. So the aim of this first session is to present an overview of the BAT conclusions, best available technique conclusions, and the implications for existing and for new permits. And the next slide, please. First, it's only correct that we mentioned the EU exit and its impact on the breath. It's early days and we don't know I'll carry on. It's early days and we don't know the exact terms and conditions of the exit, but what we do know is that we're working on the assumption that all EU legislation will be transposed into domestic law on day one of us leaving. We're also working on the assumption that all breaths adopted before the official exit date will fully apply, even if the compliance date is several years afterwards. And the pigs and poultry breath, that's been adopted already, so therefore we should go ahead with implementing it. And next slide, please. We're now going to have an initial look at the back conclusions and what they are. So there are 34 back conclusions. 30 of these are relevant for pig farms, and the other four are specific only to poultry. There are then two types of back conclusions. First is called narrative bat and this is basically a description of the technique. And then we have BAT AELs. These are BAT associated emission levels, basically numeric limits that, have, that need to be met. And for pigs and poultry, we have BAT AELs for ammonia. The BAT conclusion will also include a statement about its applicability. For example, whether existing farms can meet the standard or if a certain animal type can meet it. At the bottom of the screen is an example of a narrative bat conclusion. So this is bat five about the efficient use of water. It states what the technique is. So in order to use water efficiently, bat is to use a combination of the techniques given below. There is then a table of the techniques. And the first line A is to keep a record of water use, and it then says that technique is generally applicable. The next technique is to detect and repair water leaks, and this is also generally applicable. 
Then the third line shown is to use high pressure cleansers for cleaning animal housing and equipment. For its applicability, it says that it's not applicable to poultry plants using dry cleaning systems. So therefore, this means that it would be applicable to pigs and also to poultry plants not using dry cleaning. Also note that the back text states that it's back to use a combination of techniques. So this means more than one of the techniques. Other back conclusions say to use one or more of the techniques. Others say to use all of the techniques. So that's something to look out for when we're looking at the back conclusions. Next slide, please. So when do the new back conclusions apply? As Sue has highlighted, the new back conclusions are published on the 21st of February this year. The conclusions apply to all new farms permitted after the 21st of February, and they also to apply to all new housing first permitted after the 21st of February. So the terms new farm and new plant or new housing are defined in the back conclusions and this means that for sites expanding above the threshold, both new and existing housing will need to meet the back conclusions. It also means that new housing at farms that already have a permit will need to meet the back conclusions. And this includes a complete replacement of a building on existing foundations. Next slide, please. So what are the implications for existing permits? So under the Industrial Emissions Directive, publication of the back conclusions triggers the need to review all permits within four years of the date of publication. This review will check that all existing permits meet the new standards. And where they don't, the operator will need to demonstrate how they will meet the new standards within four years of the publication date. We're aiming to start the review process within 12 months of publication of the back conclusions. Um, we'll be focusing on the more complex sites first to give the operators more time. All existing farms will need to comply with the new back conclusions by 21st of February 2021. Next slide, please. We're developing a plan to review all 1,250 of our permits. We're taking a light touch approach with the aim of minimising the administrative burden for both yourselves, industry and ourselves as well. The first stage will be to check that your farm meets the new standards. The majority of the back conclusions are already covered by your current permits, but permits will still need to be updated to include the new BAT AELs and associated reporting. We'll be issuing a variation notice to update your permit and please note that there will be a charge for this variation. Next slide, please. In terms of the approach, we need to establish whether permitted farms are already using BAT techniques. To try and make this a little more straightforward, we're preparing a questionnaire to help you address each BAT conclusion in turn. This will be sent to you by your environment officer. The questionnaire will enable you to identify which techniques you already use for your particular housing systems and management systems, and if you do not meet these requirements now, but they are applicable to your farm, how you intend to meet them in the future. At the end of the exercise, you'll have identified whether your farm needs to do anything in order to comply. We will then discuss with you your proposals of how you intend to meet the requirements and where necessary, this will be included in your permit as an improvement requirement with appropriate timescales. When you're completing the questionnaire, please do include as much information as your farm as about your farm as possible. And um, for example, if you use multiple systems in multiple houses, it may be easy to provide the information separately for each. Further information will be provided about this. We hope to complete this exercise voluntarily. However, we do have statutory powers that we can use to require the information from operators who don't respond. Next slide, please. In terms of timescales, we're currently in the planning phase, and this is the last in a series of farmer workshops that have taken place. During the winter, we plan to begin the review process and to start sending out the questionnaires. From April 2018, we'll then start to issue variation notices. As we've got four years to complete the process, we have until around January 21, 2021 to complete this process. Next slide, please. 
Coming back to the fact that all new housing has to meet the back conclusions, if you're considering expanding your site or building new housing, please do contact your environment officer. They will be able to check that your proposals will meet the appropriate AELs and BAT standards and be able to offer you advice. If your proposals don't meet the standards in the BAT conclusions, then we may not be able to issue a permit. I'll now pass over to Tom to go through the BAT conclusions and AELs in more detail. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm just going to focus in a little bit more in a bit more detail about what the back conclusions uh, document looks like and the format. The back conclusions document is split into several sections. The first uh, introductory section um, is the scope and provides some useful definitions, which are important for uh, for understanding the the technical context of the conclusions. Then there are the back conclusions, which, as Alison has already said, there are 34 of these, and of which 30 apply to uh, pig farms. As we've already covered, there's usually uh, a statement of what the conclusion is, followed by a table of what the techniques are and when they apply. The final section of the conclusions document is a further description of the techniques. For some of the conclusions, you do need to move between the back conclusions themselves and the description of the techniques section to get all of the information. Having reviewed the back conclusions in detail, we believe that the majority of the new, new requirements are already covered by your existing permits and the existing technical standards that you have to meet through your permit. But there are some new requirements that we'll talk about in a little bit more detail. We will be updating our how to comply guidance and publishing that in due course. Uh, and this will help to explain how to use, how to interpret the back conclusions and guide you through what you need to do. And we'll cover that in a bit more detail later on. Uh, I'm not going to talk through each back conclusion in, in great detail, but I'm just going to highlight some of the conclusions and, and also hopefully uh, this will reassure you that many of the techniques are, are already being met by your current permit. So first off, uh, the first back conclusion is uh, the environment management system conclusion. Um, and uh, this is just to give you an example. So. BAT1 is to have an environment management system or an EMS. Uh, this is essentially a set of procedures that describes what you'll need to do to minimize risk of pollution from the activities covered by your permit. For farms, this will mean bringing together many of your existing records and plans that you already have in place. It covers staff training and those records, your site maintenance regime, uh, your emergency procedures and what to do to prevent from pollution, uh, your site decommissioning plan, your odour and noise management plans, and um, so all documents are already held on farm. There are some new aspects and uh, these are around, and if you read the back conclusions, there are new aspects around benchmarking, which um, is new to the sector, but the but is, but is standard across all uh, environment management system back conclusions across all sectors, as well as uh, a requirement to have an environmental policy statement in place. Benchmarking will be done, we anticipate, through uh, the inspections of your farms and with reference to uh, the ammonia emission rates from your housing, which we'll describe in a bit more detail. Additionally, uh, there are back conclusions around odour and noise management plans, and if you read the conclusions, there, they are, there are a number of conclusions covering odour and noise. However, we've reviewed this in detail, and we believe our current approach of having an odour management plan where you have uh, nearby residents within 400 metres um, is adequate, and the current conditions in your permit requiring you to review your odour management plan or your noise management plan if it's a noise issue and to take uh, remedial action uh, should an issue arise um, is more than adequate. Similarly, there are requirements around slurry storage, but these are largely the same as um, the existing SAFO requirements, so no real change there. Something that is new is the requirement for annual monitoring. So um, BAT 29 um, is a, it requires you to monitor water, electric, fuel, animal numbers, feed consumption, and manure generation. Um, so, uh, thank you, sir. Yep. Um, this 
this is already being recorded, so it isn't really new, but we'll need to check those records as part of your compliance visit. We won't be requiring them to send those in to us as part of your annual reporting. Um, so again, hopefully this reassures you that some of the, the new technical requirements set out in the back conclusions are, are familiar and, and actually uh, no real step change. But what is new are BAT associated emission levels. Um, the conclusions include BAT associated emission levels for ammonia emissions which will apply to the majority of permits as well as BAT associated levels for nitrogen and phosphorus excretion. A BAT associated emission level, an AEL, is a performance benchmark which determines whether an activity is meeting the best available technique requirements. The, the AELs, the associated emission levels, um, are set by the European Bureau in consultation with all of the member states using a systematic approach to review all of the information that was collected from across Europe during the breath drafting process. And the UK and uh, the trade bodies um, have been working closely with us during the breath negotiations um, um, over the last, I think, it took around eight years to develop. So there's been a lot of negotiation and a lot of information submitted from the UK to try and influence the, the AELs. And the proposed AELs um, have been around now for, for a couple of years. They were published in the 2015 draft document. So for some of these AELs, these, these performance benchmarks, uh, for some types of rearing practices, there are stricter standards which will apply to farms and houses Per, permitted after the new back conclusions are first published, were, are published, which was in February early this year. So we're just going to have a look at uh, a back conclusion in a bit more detail, and this one's around housing. Um, so on the screen, um, this is BAT 30, which is quite a key back conclusion for the pig sector. Uh, this one is um, is a table of describing the types of pig housing that is BAT and as you'll see at the top it says and, and by the way this is just a small snippet rather than the complete table it actually runs over a, an entire uh, page and a, and a bit I think so uh, there's a lot more different types of housing but we just wanted to show you this snippet as, a, as an example so um, the, the back conclusion states what the technique is, applies to so it says in order to reduce ammonia emissions to air from the pig house BAT is to use one or a combination of techniques given below and and the the, the um, example on the screen is around deep pit housing so it says a deep pit in the case of a fully or partially slatted floor is BAT only if used in combination with additional ammonia mitigation levels and it describes those as being uh, a combination of nutritional management te techniques, uh, an air cleaning system, so that would be uh, an ammonia scrubber or an air cleaning system that are more typical in, in, the likes, in other countries such as Denmark, uh, a pH reduction of the slurry system, which um, again is, is, is commonly used in, uh, in Denmark particularly, and um, there's some interest in, in it being adopted in the UK, or slurry cooling, which is the, uh, um, reducing the temperature of the the slurry to reduce ammonia emissions. So um, that is the description of the technique um, and um, the applicability criteria on the right is very important. So um, what that's saying is, is that for deep pit floor um, housing systems, they are not applicable to new, new housing unless the deep pit is combined with either an air cleaning system, slurry cooling or a, a pH reduction system. So um, moving forward, if you're considering uh, installing deep pit housing, you'll need to consider in using one of those three techniques or an equivalent technique to reduce the ammonia emissions sufficiently down. The second part of the back conclusion is the actual table of uh, the associated emission levels. And on this screen here, on this slide here, we've got the BAT associated emission levels for ammonia from pig housing. So as you'll see, uh, the, the uh, animal categories are split into mating and gestating sows, for which there is a BAT AEL figure, bowering sows, weaners and fattening pigs. 
The BAT AEL is expressed as a range from 0.2 to 2.7, as you can see for mating and gestating sows. Uh, and when we're thinking about applying the BAT AELs, we will normally default to the upper end of the range. So what this is saying is, is that your housing to be BAT must have an emission rate of if, if we take the example of the sows, an emission rate of 2.7 kilograms of ammonia per animal place per year. Um, and similarly, that the, the, the same um, AEL uh, ranges apply for the other categories of pigs. There are also a large range of footnotes associated with, the, um, with this table. So you'll see on the screen there are there are various um, footnotes with each with each with each number. Uh, this apply this. This is because there are different values for new housing versus existing housing. And generally, there's, there's a more flexible figure for existing housing. So whereas all uh, new housing has to meet more stringent BAT AEL levels that are given in the table. Similarly, there are specific AELs for solid floor housing systems. And um, these are listed in the uh, footnotes as well. The important point to note is, is that the ALs are expressed as emission factors um, and they shouldn't be confused with the emission factors that we use with ammonia screening. The ALs, just to remind everybody, are a performance benchmark and the performance benchmark, um, if you can meet that, that, that AL means that your housing system is BAT and therefore acceptable. So, um, right, I think we're missing a slide there, but uh, don't worry. Um, so, assessing compliance with ammonia AELs, um, we will, with the, the BAT conclusions, give a number of options for assessing compliance. You can use um, uh, ammonia monitoring, so you can monitor emissions from your housing. Uh, uh, ammonia monitors uh, to an, an agree a protocol at specified int intervals, or you can use standard emission factors, which we anticipate many farmers will opt to do. Um, as many of you are aware, we use standard emission factors for assessing ammonia emissions when you're applying for a new permit or for a variation or expanding your farm. And those emission factors are derived from the UK ammonia inventory. Can, can you move to the next slide, please? Sorry. Yeah, so um, for assessing air emissions from pig farms. Uh, the UK emission factors, and so here on the screen are some of the typical ammonia emission factors for wieners, growers, and pigs. Uh, we've got uh, the typical emission factors for fully slatted floor systems, and we've also got uh, typical emission factors for sol solid floor straw systems as well. Um, so we're, we're looking at that in a bit more detail, but for some types of housing, um, and pig types, the BAT AELs are actually lower than our current standard emission factors. So, for instance, the BAT AEL for new housing for finisher, finishers on fully slatted flooring is 2.6 kilograms of ammonia per animal place per year, whereas the standard emission factor uh, for, for this, this category of pig and housing type is 4.14 kilograms of ammonia per year. So, that type of housing won't meet the new BAT AEL. This means that new housing with fully slatted flooring with deep pit storage would not automatically meet the BAT AEL, and that is why the applicability criteria in the previous uh, table is so important. What that's saying there is that if you're going to install deep pit storage, you need to install one of the three ammonia mitigation techniques uh, to, to meet that, and we'll talk about that in a bit more detail in a moment. We are working with the industry um, to review our standard uh, emission factors and um, the, uh, the UK uh, inventory of ammonia emissions for agriculture is the source of the ammonia emission factors that we use for assessing ammonia emissions. And these, uh, this information is based on trials from the mid to late 1990s, which is considerably um, a long time ago from a perspective of pig genetics and the way that the industry has moved forward in the, in the, in the last 10, 15 years. Um, we've collated our standard emission factors based on both the inventory, information and evidence submitted as part of the breath drafting process and also data submitted from, um, from operators and farmers. Uh, we've also been 
working with AHDB Pork, uh, who have been undertaking some monitoring at several farms, and we've been evaluating and using that data that's been submitted. Um, and we've also commissioned a literature review of all available uh, uh, scientific evidence of around ammonia emissions to try and uh, get the best information available. So we are looking at that in more detail, and we'll continue to do that with the industry over the coming weeks and, and months. In addition to the ammonia AELs, there are also two other AELs. So um, there is one for nitrogen excreted, uh, nitrogen excretion, um, and uh, the BAT AEL is, is, is now on the screen. Uh, and in, in order to reduce nitrogen excretion and consequently ammonia emissions whilst meeting the nutritional needs of the pig, uh, BAT is to use a diet formulation and nutritional strategy which includes one or, or a combination of techniques. Um, and as you can see on the screen, their technique A is to reduce crude protein content by using nitrogen uh, and balanced diets uh, based on energy needs and digestible amino acids. Technique B is multiple-phase feeding. Um, and also technique C is around uh, additional addition of controlled amounts of essential amino acids and um, to use a low-crude crude protein diet. And similarly, like the ammonia, um, uh, back conclusions, we've got an applicability criteria as well. Uh, alongside the, the table describing the techniques, we have the actual um, associated emission levels, uh, and these are described on screen now. So we've got a bat range, uh, the bat associated total nitrogen excreted, which is given in animal place per year for weaners, fattening pigs, and sows. Uh, and in discussions with the industry, um, we are um, fairly confident that these, these new AELs can be met uh, through, through existing diets, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a moment. We also have a, a back conclusion for phosphorus excretion. Um, and in a very similar way, um, but in order to reduce the total phosphorus excreted whilst meeting the nutritional needs of animals, BAT is to use a DART formulation and a nutritional strategy which includes one or a combinations of the techniques listed in the table. Uh, again, we've got here uh, multi-phase feeding with DART formulation adapted to, to the specific requirements of the pig. Uh, use of authorized feed additives, which reduce the, the amount of total phosphorus excreted, for example, phytase, and uh, C is the use of highly digestible inorganic phosphates for partial replacement of conventional sources of, of phosphate. Um, and as you will see there, um, there you, you don't necessarily need to use all of those techniques. You can use one or a combination. Similarly, we've got an excretion um, AEL range there, which um, again, we'll talk about in a little more detail later. For both the nitrogen and the phosphorus excretion values, you can use standard excretion factors or you can, um, and you can use analysis, so you can do analysis of your manures and slurries, or you can use a mass balance calculation. Uh, the back, new BAT conclusions require that you demonstrate um, you're meeting the BAT AELs annually, um, and um, obviously that will require, um, you know, we, we anticipate many will be using the mass balance calculation formula, um, and the reporting requirement will be included in permits from, for existing farms, so the existing permitted sites from 2021. I'm now going to hand you over to Emma, who's going to uh, talk about the uh, nitrogen and phosphorus excretion tool that's been developed. Okay, so um, this is an example of the tool developed with AIC and nutritionists as a method of measuring NMP levels, as Tom's mentioned. So the tool's been created for both pig and poultry and will be available to all producers so they're able to input their individual farm-specific data into it. So you don't need to pay too much attention to the figures in the table, it's more for demonstrative purposes. But you can see down the left-hand side you have the diet type, and then the next two columns there you've got the crude protein and the phosphorus percentages of that diet. So the tool um, has equations and calculations in the background, but based on the figures that you enter, 
and um, will come out with a kilogram of N and P excretion per pig place per annum, which you can see at the bottom of the screen. This, um, it will also calculate the percentage and tell you where you are or where your figure is in comparison to the VAT limits, um, which you can see highlighted in red there. So the plans are for this to be available soon, um, and as Tom mentioned, will be an alternative method to measuring NMP excretions as stated in the VAT conclusions. So um, in this section of the presentation, I'm going to cover, over, cover what factors influence and reduce emissions um, and the basic science behind them. Um, I'm then going to go on to what we've got to play with in terms of what options are available to producers in order to meet these BAT ALs. And then following on from that, I'm going to go through a small selection um, of ammonia reduction technologies, describe a bit of how they work, um, and then relate them to a reduction percentage. So when I say a reduction percentage, um, this is going to be how much that technology can reduce emissions compared to the reference system, um, which is the fully, um, fully slatted deep pit system. Okay, so what reduces emissions? So on the diagrams that you can see on your screen, um, those above the red dotted line are some basic alterations that can be made. Um, those below um, are slightly more detailed, complicated, and probably a little bit more costly to implement. So to start with, reducing the amount of emitting surfaces, um, which is on the, what's in the middle at the top, will reduce the amount of ammonia release. So that's working on the fact that the smaller the area, the lower the emission level. As you might expect, the more frequently you remove your slurry from the pit to an external store, this will also reduce your emissions. Um, and also by using surfaces that are smooth and easy to clean will prevent build up of materials sticking to areas, again reducing emission factors. So um, below the line then you've got additional treatments such as aeration on the bottom right, um, cooling of the manure surface to about 5 degrees, um, so typically taking that down from about 17 degrees, that will prevent emissions and also changing the chemical and physical properties of the manure by de decreasing the pH. So, um, the science behind that is if you're reducing the pH, that's stopping the chemical reaction from occurring. So you're locking in ammonium into the slurry and you're reducing ammonia being emitted to the uh, environment. So another benefit of that is you are actually increasing your availability when you're applying that to land by about 15%. Um, but I'll go through uh, some of these in more detail as we go through. So what other things or what do you as a producer have to play with? So the first one is feed, as Tom has mentioned, um, that could be multi-phase feeding, make sure your N and P levels are correct depending on the age of pig that you're feeding. Um, a lot of this is what people are doing already, so um, not much new, but I'll touch on feed again in a minute. The second one is floor type, so different floor types will affect emissions, so uh, for example, um, the emission will be greater from slatted floors than a part slatted system as the emitting air, uh, surface area is going to be larger. The third one is slurry and manure removal, so how frequently you're removing it will affect emissions. Um, and if you've got a straw-based system, adding straw to the dung area, again, will play a part in reducing the emissions. The fourth on the top left is the end of pipe measures, and it tends to be the last resort. So if you can't get below the emission levels using techniques one to three, um, you would look at things such as air scrubbing and biofilters. Um, but as I've mentioned, tend to be quite costly and the running costs are quite high. Um, so as I mentioned, again, not going to go through very much detail and you can kind of read from the slide there. Um, feed is number one. Um, very basic. A lot of the industry are doing this already. Um, and yeah, reducing nitrogen and phosphorus can be achieved by those techniques. So this slide is just an indication um, of how reducing crude protein can play um, its part. So on the second column, you've got the crude protein percentage on average from 1995 to about 2002. Um, and typically protein levels used today are seen in the third column. So as a general rule, it's dropped by about 2%. So as the footnote says um, at the bottom, the EA work on a 1% dietary crude protein reduction, resulting in a 10% reduction in ammonia levels. So um, as you can see, the reduction in 2% crude protein 
has resulted in a 20% reduction in ammonia. So if you want to look at reducing emissions, um, demonstrating a reduction in protein might be the only way that you can achieve this. Um, having said that, it is worth noting though that before you do that, it's worth uh, speaking to your nutritionist. Um, as a lot are arguing that the modern pig um, require a higher protein diet to perform. So the second point was floor type. So as I mentioned, a fully slatted floor will have a greater emission level than a part slatted one. And a fully slatted deep pit system will be considered the worst case scenario. So I'm going to take you through the different systems, different types and techniques for each, um, and I've colour coded them, so hopefully that will make them clear. So um, you've got red for fully slatted, green for part, and green, uh, sorry, yellow <laughs> for the solid floor. Um, so, yeah. So as I mentioned previously, a deep pit is class classed as the reference system, so the worst case scenario. Um, and I've put there that anything over 900 millimetres in depth will be considered um, a deep pit. So under the new breath, if you have deep pits in existing housing, this is okay as long as you new, use nutritional techniques to reduce your emissions. However, if, if you are going to be putting up new buildings um, under the new breath, you will still need to use um, another technique. Um, so that can be, as demonstrated on the slide, air cleaning, pH reduction or slurry cooling. So these are the photos um, taken from the old breath. Um, so vacuum system with frequent slurry removal. Um, for vacuum system, this simply means that when you pull the sluice, you create a vacuum. So it sucks everything out um, a bit like a bath. Um, and for frequent emptying, this can result in a reduction of a 25% um, from the standard emission factor. Again, if you also have, um, if you also use that with a part slatted floor, you actually increase that reduction to about 35%. Um, so a reduced manure pit, so this is simply reducing the emitting surface. So you're decreasing the size of your manure pit, um, and this is very similar to a part slatted system, and that gives you a 20% um, reduction. So this one, um, a combination of water and manure channels can give you as much as a 52% reduction. So um, here the diagram showing a farrowing pen that's fully slatted, can be divided into two halves with a barrier um, and you need to think about having two thirds and one third. So the first part which will be at the front of the farrowing crate would be for the liquids and the third um, which is the back would be for the thicker stuff. So instead of having a T-shape which you can see from the top diagram, um, it could be as simple as just putting a, a straight board in the middle so it's a straight line. Um, this, the, the way that this works by reducing fact, um, emissions is because you're keeping the watery fraction, which is lower in emitting um, ammonia, and the solid fraction apart. Um, so when they join, they'll be causing a chemical reaction, which is increasing your emissions. So when you come to wash out, um, if you have two sluice gates, this can also um, work in your benefit. So you can release the, the watery fraction first and using this to help clear out the solid areas. So it's a very simple thing that can be um, fitted into your firing houses, and you can get quite a significant reduction from this technique. So manure collection in water, this again is a very simple and effective um, technique which gives you 40% reduction. So uh, at the end of the batch, when you come to wash out, you can do the first wash um, and let that go. And this gets rid, rid of the majority, put the plug back in, and then rewash, uh, leaving about 120 to 150 mils of water left in the pits. Um, and again, we'll achieve that and give you a 40% reduction. So this, um, this table here acts as a bit of a worked example. So these figures are for a fully slatted deep pit system, which is, as I've mentioned several times, is a reference system. So you have the weight of pigs in the second column, um, which you can probably see the mouse highlighting, and the BAT AEL for ammonia is the limit that needs to be met for each category. So it will be different depending on the age of pigs, and it will also be different depending on whether it's a new or existing build. So the percentage of ammonia reduction required is a percentage that needs to be reduced in order to get below that BAT AEL. So you'll see again that that column is highlighting that you need quite a significant reduction uh, in some of these cases, particularly for the new builds. 
So this is kind of demonstrating some of the options. So, for example, slurry vacuum uh, removal equates to about 25% reduction. So this is 25% of the um, emission factor. Um, so this alone will um, this alone will, will get existing wean or existing finishing buildings below the VAT AL. So you won't need to apply any other techniques. You've achieved that. However, for the new weaner and the new finisher buildings, which have a lower BAT AL, further techniques will need to be provided. Um, so you could look at potentially reducing the crude protein by 20%, which will give you a 20% reduction in ammonia. Um, and that will get you to 0.5 and 2.48, 2.48, which are then below your BAT AL. So identifying kind of where you are and where you need to be and how you're going to get there by playing around with these options is, is a really important starting point and allows you to identify the options available to you. So slurry and manure management, what are your options here? Well, the two we've kind of picked out and highlighted is pH reduction and slurry cooling. So for the pH reduction, if you take the pH um, below 6, this stops the reaction of ammonia to ammonia. So typically um, commonly used in Denmark and um, it's taken down to about 5.5 and they do this by using sulfuric acid. You can use um, other options though they are available but sulfuric is considered to be the most economic. Um, I'm not going to go into much detail about that but if you do want to know more about the technique um, we do have a photo story on our website and some extra information um, if you wish to have a look. So the second one is slurry cooling um, there's a lot of growing interest with this one actually. So slurry um, is usually about 17 degrees um, and you drop that down to about 5-ish. Um, and again, you can get benefits from this because you can take the heat that you're taking out and use it elsewhere. So if you had a wiener house that you wished to heat, um, that would be a good source for it. Um, just a little bit of science about that. If you're, if you're lowering the temperature of the slurry, that stops the microbial activity which releases ammonia gases. So that's how you achieve the reduction there. And the final one is um, end of pipe measures. So Holland and parts of Belgium have to have an air scrubber on their um, buildings. Um, but it does, as you can see, give you really good reductions, but tends to be quite costly. Um, and you don't necessarily have any added value uh, other than it just cleaning the air. So just to give you an idea of costs, um, it's reported that sort of an air scrubber being fitted to a building is about 75 to 80 pounds per pig place and about one pound per pig plate running cost. So um, as I covered earlier, it's sort of the last resort if you can't achieve the reduction using other techniques, um, this might be your only option. So I'm not going to repeat this slide again, but it's just a reminder of the factors that reduce emissions and the techniques that I've covered off will fall into various categories within that spider diagram. Um, so hopefully that's given you a quick but helpful overview what can be done to reduce ammonia emissions on farm. But if you do need more detail or explanations or further details on any of those, then please do get in touch. I think, Tom, you might be covering off a little bit about what producers can do if they want to consider alternative techniques. Yeah, if you if you are considering a technique, then we're, we're very keen to hear from you. We've, um, you know, come and talk to us and we'll talk to, talk to you about what the evidence you need to collect and how to demonstrate those reductions. We have some guidance online about uh, called our new technologies document which gives a, a, an overview on how to structure your submission but we'd be keen to hear from you and happy to talk things through. Okay, the final session, we're going to have a quick look at the real quick reminder of the key next steps and then identify where you can go for further information. So the key next step for farmers with existing permits is the permit review. So we're finalising the approach at the moment and we'll then be beginning the back gap analysis in the winter of this year. You'll receive a questionnaire from your environment officer, which you'll then need to complete and then return uh, to them. Around the same time, we'll issue the revised How to Comply guidance, that's our, our farm guidance. And then from April 2018, we'll start to issue permit variations to, to farmers. And as we've got four years to complete this review, so this may well continue until January 2020, uh, 2021. 
So in terms of how to comply guidance, so the revised pharma guidance, it's going to have a different format to the current version. So instead of being a document, it's going to be web text on the government website, gov.uk. And it's going to have a similar format to the caring for pig guidance that's on, on gov.uk at the moment. And we're working with the trade associations, including HD Pork, on this guidance. And we're also keen to, to receive pharma, guide, uh, pharma feedback on the draft guidance as it's produced as well. So while we're working on the revised pharma guidance, the key source of information is the back conclusions that are, have, have been published back in February. And the easiest way to find them is to uh, you can go to the HDB Port website, and they've got those um, them, them saved a, a link onto there. Or you can search them online. You can simply do that by just using the keywords pig and back conclusions. And they're then on a couple of official websites, and the, 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 the bottom link they're shown is to the Euro Web, Europa website where you can download the, the back conclusions. Back conclusions, it's a nice, it's about a fifth, uh, around a 50 page document and it's, not, it's nice and easy to download. To be aware that the full breath document, which is also on that web page, is considerably larger at um, several hundred, I mean, about a thousand pages long, and it's also about 18 megabytes as well. So if you just want to um, just have a, a quick overview, then the, the back conclusions themselves is the best document to go to. So if you are thinking of making changes to your farm and adding new housing, or if you've got any questions, then in the first instance, please do speak to your environment officer. They'll be able to talk you through what the back conclusions mean for your farm. And if you're unsure who your, your local environment officer is, you can call our customer contact center. The number's there, 03708 506 506. And they'll be able to put you in touch with your local office. And you can also contact Nigel, Sue, and Emma at AHDB Pork, who can help you further as well. And there's the email address for them and their, their website address as well. Okay. That's okay, it. That's now the, the end of the presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Alison, and to all our presenters so far. As you can see, there are some key changes, but much is remaining the same. I'm now going to hand over to Nigel to read out the questions one at a time, and they'll be answered by the team. So. Okay, thank you, Sue. Okay, the first question is the same question type twice. Emma did answer it, but uh, we'll just go over it again. First question was, how deep is a slurry pit, and uh, what, when does a, uh, what depth does a pit change from frequent emptying to actually storage? So, Tom, would you like to answer that one? Um, well, I think we are. It's currently part of the technical interpretation work that we're doing. Um, I think Emma referred to uh, uh, frequent removal new housing to being around 900 mil in depth, um, with a frequency uh, and and frequent is designed um, is defined as soon as uh, practicable um, to allow slurry to flow out of of the sheds. Thank you, Tom. And uh, we have to remember that in that 900 mil, we have to allow 300 mil free board as a minimum for meeting various legal requirements. The second question, again, confirm, uh, deals with slurry in pits. And it asks, and this comes up quite often, does moving slurry generate more ammonia as it needs to be mixed twice? And what is achieved by moving slurry from A to B? Tom, would you like to answer that one? The uh, ammonia rates from different types of housing and slurry handling um, are based on the best available information that is published. Um, and there are a variety of different publications that um, support the uh, support the, the frequent removal of slurry to a covered slurry uh, store um, to support the fact that that will reduce reduce ammonia emissions from within the, within the houses. So um, that has been, um, yeah, that is supported both in the breath and um, the uh, recent NEC, UNECD uh, docu uh, guide document on ammonia mitigation from livestock housing. Okay, thank you for, to that, for Tom for that. And the other point to make is that in the in the breath they are talking about it being moved from the house to a covered slurry store, 
so, and it is the length of time that it's in the house does uh, increase the amount of ammonia. So if you move it away quickly into a covered slurry, slurry store, then there's less chance for that ammonia to go into the atmosphere. Okay, another question which has come up again, it was in the in the talk, but we'll just cover it again. So who's going to send out the questionnaire? Tom or Alison? Yeah, I could do that one. So the, the plan is that our local um, environment officers, that they'll be sending out the, the questionnaire to their individual operators and then working with, with them to complete it. Um, so it might be done, it, it's entirely up to the, the local staff and, and farmers how they want to, to play that. But it's, it's likely that it will be emailed out to farmers and uh, can then be completed electronically and returned or it could be done um, on a paper cup paper copy or could be done on on-site visit as well. It's going to vary depending on the circumstances, but the, the aim primarily is though to email that out to, to operators from the local officer. Thank you, Alison. And that's the key point. The questionnaires and communications to you will only come directly from the environment agency and your local officer. The next question is along the similar lines. So will we need to complete the questionnaires if we have just had a variation issued? So this is for people that are maybe just having a variation issued now or in the next couple of months, will you still have to do the questionnaire? Alison or Tom? Um, yeah, okay, well, I'll answer this one. Um, yeah, the, it, um, it all depends. Um, and currently at the moment, yes, if you're having a variation at the moment, uh, yeah, you will, um, you will need to complete the questionnaire for your existing element of the farm. So if you're applying for a variation at the moment, we'll be checking with you to ensure that the new buildings are, are BAT and meeting the new BAT standards. Um, and um, we will then review the existing housing um, when we've got the guidance and ready, uh, when the guidance is ready and, and published. Uh, moving forward though, if you apply once the review has started, then we will try and combine both together so that it's, um, you, so you don't have to do the questionnaire at the same time. So as it stands currently, yeah, if, you're, if you have a variation in with us at the moment, yeah, you will need to complete a questionnaire. Okay, thank you for that, Tom. Okay, um, a few, few questions now coming in. So actually while we're talking about variations, I'll jump to this one. What is the cost of, for the variations that will be, be required for the reviews? That the cost, the current cost for the variations for a variation is three hundred and eighty pounds. But we are about to, um, we we are going to be consulting on our charging um, proposals for two thousand and eighteen uh, to two thousand and twenty three shortly. So the um, it, within that within those proposals, there are increases to the proposed for uh, variation applications. But we are, as part of the initial feedback with the trade associations and with um, on, on the proposed charges, we are looking at that charge for these reviews, specifically for the BREF reviews, and, and, and working up uh, a cost for that based on a light touch uh, and light touch from a technical perspective um, approach. The, we will be looking to recover costs for the technical work in delivering the variations, but that, that figure is yet to be confirmed. Okay, thank you, Tom. So, along, again, sort of following a bit of a theme, really, the next question is to do with emission factors, and Tom, you did refer to them. Basically, it says, out-of-date emission factors are being challenged by measurement. There is measurement work going on. It says, new measurement work is going to be undertaken. When will any new emission factors that are acceptable to the Environment Agency be published? And secondly, will new permit, permits being issued wait for new factors to be published? So basically, when are we going to get some new emission factors and will you be delaying the issue of new permits until you have those emission factors? Tom, would you like to take that one? We certainly won't delay any uh, the issuing of permits um, uh, wherever possible, and it certainly isn't that you know 
we, we, we would want to issue permits as quickly as we can um, and also variations as, as, as quickly as technically feasible. Um, we are reviewing the emission factors based on uh, some of the literature review work that we've done and also some of the feedback that we've received from the industry around the, the standard emission factors being out of date. Um, the current standard emission factors are based on what we have, you know, the best available information that's that, that's out there, um, you know, and that's what um, some, you know, that, that's why we commissioned uh, a literature review to cast the net to see whether there is any additional information. But the emission factors are based on the UK uh, ammonia inventory, which is compiled by DEFRA annually, which looks at all of the published data, um, and uh, you know, and, and d devises emission factors uh, accordingly. Um, we are. Um, keen to uh, um, you know work with the industry to and look at uh, available data from from um, from English pig farms we're really keen to get that information um, the approach to using standard emission factors in the first place was agreed as as an alternative approach to um, requiring every farm to, to monitor ammonia emissions within sheds, which can be uh, very expensive to do. So um, the, the the approach of using standard emission factors was was is designed to save that that, that those costs. Um, so um, yeah, we as to when um, new emission factors will be published, that will depend on 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 the, the information that that is submitted from the industry, um, and will be based on along those timelines. So we are. Um, as I think we said earlier in the presentation, we really we are um, we've got that new technologies guidance, and if operators want to have site-specific uh, discussions about uh, emission rates from their sheds, then um, we'll, we're very much open to those conversations around uh, what the most appropriate emission factor will be. But we will need a good evidence trail and a good audit trail to demonstrate that those emission rates are, are achievable, and that's the most important factor. We need to be sure that well, we need to have um, we need to we need to be sure that those emission rates set in a permit are going to be achievable, and certainly um, we've had some uh, initial uh, studies from AHDB from some monitoring that indicates that some of the uh, some types of pig uh, emission rates are potentially lower. So um, it's about building on that and um, getting enough evidence together to to actually change the emission factors accordingly. Okay, thank you, Tom. The next question, which actually follows very nicely from that, is should growth rates and feed conversion ratios not be considered as a good technique for reducing ammonia? Perhaps I'll answer that one. Basically, we would picked up on the, the growth rates, emission and uh, FCRs were improving. Therefore, logically, we would expect the emission factors now for modern pigs in modern housing regardless of the, the, whether they're on straw or slats or solid floor should be lower. However, it's a little bit more complex than just the, the growth rate and the feed conversion. It's actually the, uh, the conversion or the efficiency of conversion of nitrogen in those pigs to, to, um, to meat and the excretion of nitrogen. So the less nitrogen that is being excreted, the lower the emission form uh, ammonia compounds. Therefore, we actually started doing some emissions monitoring work, and as Tom said, the indications are that that's all going in the, in the right direction, and that modern production for, uh, uh, systems with good feeding, the feed technology that's out available to the industry now, the health, the genetics, uh, management, husbandry, is all driving the emissions down. So that's why we're going to be doing more work in this area and working very closely with allied industries in that area. So yes, it, it, it is the basic uh, principles of what we're doing, however it's just a little bit more than straightforward growth rates and feed conversion efficiencies. Um, and that follows on to the next question which is uh, saying that pigs on fully slatted floors grow quicker than any other surface which would mean that typically they eat less food and convert better and create less slurry. Well, certainly the faster that they grow and the more efficiently they are, are converting food to uh, 
for converting food and the less nitrogen excreted is the key point. The floor type does make a difference, um, but actually we've now got straw-based systems which are producing, which are um, going just as well as slatted systems. So it is all to do with management, and it is all to do with the feed, the feeding, and the feed conversion conversion efficiencies. Hence the reason why we need to be updating the emission factors and the emission data, which nobody has done for quite a long time now, as the report Tom mentioned referred to a report that the Environment Agency commissioned highlighted that actually we are using data from quite a number of years back. And that's purely because research uh, hasn't been carried out in the last few years. UK is not alone in this. Um, the, the same is happening on, in continental Europe, and there is a, a severe lack of good up-to-date emission factor data. We seek to address that. Okay, I've got no more questions in front of me. So, do any of the speakers want to got anything they want to pick up on? No, no nothing from anybody. Okay, well, anything from you, Tom? Sorry, I was on the no, no, nothing from me, thanks. Okay, well, we hope you found the, uh, the webinar useful. Uh, as I mentioned, it is being recorded and will be available on our website shortly. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Thanks to our presenters and to the webinar team also who have been supporting us this evening. Um, hope you have a very good evening. Goodbye.